Thank you for watching Scary Bear Attacks. If you like this episode, please remember to hit the like button and leave a comment or two. Then subscribe and click on the bell to receive notifications of whenever we release new videos. Also, please remember to share them to your social media. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us back to familiar territory. You guessed it. We're going back to the area around Yellowstone National Park to a backcountry trail system that includes the Pelican Trailhead. I'm sure you are familiar with the geography and plant life around the National Park, especially given we have done almost 10 episodes discussing attacks in this area. The forests of pine, fir, and spruce trees are interrupted by broad meadows of grass, with secretive patches of willows along the shore of any body of water. If you hike into the right places, you can see for miles and witness what some visitors call the American Serengeti. It is a comparison between the packed plains and savannas of Africa crowded with wildebeest, zebra, and predators like the African lion. The most substantial difference is bison and elk crowd. These meadows and the predators here are much more powerful and every bit as dangerous. On July 28, 1984, 25-year-old Brigida Friedenhagen was visiting the park with a couple of her family members, along with her brother Andreas and his wife Janko. They were all from Switzerland and decided to visit Yellowstone National Park and other interesting locations in the U.S. together. Brigida was adventuresome, and possibly a little too much so. As they cruised the roads surrounding and inside the park, she was clearly drawn off of this all-too-beaten path to a more remote and backcountry experience. Now, Andreas and Yonko were adventuresome, but not to the point of foolhardiness. They knew Brigida was wanting to explore wild things and have immersive experiences in nature, but they were not so inclined to participate. They listened as Brigida explained her plans to hike from the Pelican Trailhead all on the 30th, then camp out at a backcountry campsite, then finish off the hike out to Wapiti Trailhead on the 31st to meet with her brother and sister-in-law in the trailhead parking lot. They looked on as she explained the gear she had brought in anticipation of her solo adventure into the wild. She had packed her foam pad and sleeping bag, a flashlight along with a small tape recorder, to commemorate the events as she hiked. She searched through her gear and made sure she had packed her blue jeans and her flannel shirt, plus her other personal clothing items. She didn't take any cosmetics, as she planned to be alone, but did bring some sunblock for her lips as well as a prescribed respiratory stimulant known as Micarin. Beyond all of the standard backpacking gear, Brigida also brought informational brochures she grabbed from any venue they had visited. Pamphlets named Beyond Road's End, Grizzly, 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 Enjoy Them at a Distance, and Yellowstone Trails would soon take a very ironic and sardonic meaning as her story unfolded. Keep in mind, bear spray had not been invented yet, or was possibly in its infancy of development. According to the research I completed, carrying a firearm was illegal in all national parks until it passed on a legislative rider on the Card Act of 2009. At the time of Brigida's visit to the park, the latest and greatest information on grizzly bear attacks addressed surprising them as you hiked or ventured into their territory. Bear bells were considered the solution, so she packed those in her backpack as a preventative measure from attack. Brigida was a very by-the-book kind of young lady. Every trail registry her group visited had her signature, just below the small billboards covered with posters discussing the presence and dangers that black bears and grizzlies present to visitors. There were posters with illustrations on how to suspend your food from trees while visiting the backcountry, and careful directions on proper disposal of food items as well. Brigitte took careful notes of all of it, and immediately put every bit of it into practice. On July 29th, Brigida, Andreas, and Yonko entered the South Park entrance and drove to the Canyon Ranger Station. They had a brief dialogue with the rangers there and ended up purchasing a backcountry camping pass for Brigida. She relayed her plans to the rangers, detailing her departure from the Pelican Trailhead and hiking into remote campsite 5B1 for the evening, then continuing along the Wapiti Trailhead to the parking lot to end her excursion. It was a simple one-night adventure that she had planned to do by herself. Her ten-mile hike into the campground would only be a couple of climbs of a few hundred feet, so most of her trail hiking was relatively flat. Ten miles for one day, then a peaceful night's rest under the stars, in the wilderness. Sounds like a wonderful getaway. 
She was concerned, though, as she had discussed with her brother Andreas, the danger the animals in the brochure could pose while she was by herself. Nearly any animal in the brochure could be dangerous, and some of them were clearly temperamental about having humans in their area. Her mind wasn't only focused on the ill-tempered moose, but clearly more concerned about grizzly bears. Just before 11 a.m. on July 30th, Andreas and Yanko drove Brigida to the Pelican Trailhead. They hiked in with her for the first five and a half miles, and they decided she wouldn't hike all the way down the Wapiti Trail to the trailhead. Instead, Brigida would hike a little further and pitch camp to stay the evening, then hike back to the Pelican Trailhead to meet up with her brother and sister-in-law. They watched as she hefted her stuffed backpack onto her slender shoulders and then disappeared into the forest. Andreas and Yanko undoubtedly felt some apprehension and anxiety as they watched her climb the trail, but knew that this is what she had wanted to do. They hiked back to the trailhead and drove their car back to their campsite to eagerly anticipate her arrival in two days. As the days passed, they drove their vehicle back to the Pelican trailhead and parked, optimistically waiting for Brigida to emerge, radiating with pride at the completion of her adventure. They passed the time with small talk and waited and waited. As the hours turned into the better part of the day, their worries began to grow. At around 5.30 p.m., their worries culminated into action, as Brigida had now missed their rendezvous time by four hours. Scenarios had to have flashed through their minds. Did she get enchanted by a breathtaking scene that made her spend time there, causing her to be late? Had she sprained her ankle and was immobilized while waiting for rescue? They chased away the thought of anything more serious occurring. They quickly drove to the Fishing Bridge Visitor Center and reported Brigida missing to the park rangers. An emergency plan of action was devised by the rangers and was immediately implemented. The next day, August 1st, Park Ranger Marshall covered the Astrogent Creek Trail by horseback as Bill Berg and Colette Daigleberg searched around the Upper Pelican area of the trail system. A volunteer by the name of Nelson Scott covered the area between the two trails. This comprehensive search was thorough and made sure the entire trail system Brigida had indicated she would be traveling on was cleared. They searched at Campground 5B1 but found it unoccupied, and it appeared that no one had stayed there in at least a few days. As Ranger Marshall rode his horse along Astrogent Trail, he looked for bear sign among the lodgepole and spruce stands. His professional training taught him to search for telltale activity that may not be picked up by your average hiker. Evidence that a bear would leave behind that may go unnoticed by the untrained eye. He found no scat or tracks along the trail, and there was no digging along meadows. Bears will oftentimes dig into the soil and meadows for roots or to catch and eat various rodents. The elk thistle and strawberry plants were undisturbed and pocket gopher mounds remained intact. The ant hills in the area were untouched as well. It seemed eerily void of bear activity to the ranger. Just before 11.30 a.m. he arrived at Campground 5W1, which is no longer indicated on the backcountry campground map. Ranger Marshall discovered Brigida's camp. She had apparently not made the intended progress in her hike, as her campsite was placed several miles short of the backcountry campground on her permit, Site 5B1. He noticed some very concerning evidence at the campground and requested immediate assistance at the location. An investigative team was immediately flown into remote campsite 5W1. As the investigative team set out to gather any clues as to what happened to Brigida, her campsite seemed oddly organized and arrayed to be lacking her immediate presence. It looked as if she would walk out of the bushes nearby after investigating something that had caught her eye. Her tent was set to face west, and near the entry flap to her tent was a 27-inch long tear in the tent fabric. When the investigators lifted the tent flap, they could see her folded clothes placed inside a plastic bag near her foam sleeping pad. Beside the bag was her sunblock, a container of the respiratory stimulant Micarin, and a butane lighter still neatly placed on the left side of her sleeping pad. On the right side was her flashlight still in the off position, and a tape player with run-down batteries. Toward the back of the inside of her tent was her rucksack. Also in her tent was the remaining portion of a 100-gram chocolate bar inside of her rucksack. Brigitte's sleeping bag was laid out flat about six feet behind her tent. It looked as if she had laid it out in the sun to dry after getting it wet. It was still zipped and velcroed closed. 
on her sleeping bag were additional signs of a bear attack. At the approximate location of Brigida's neck while she slept in the bag were puncture wounds approximately the size and spacing of a bear's canine teeth. About 18 inches below that was a tear in the sleeping bag fabric, possibly made by the bear's claws. The investigators could see that Brigida had suspended her food cache by twine between two trees a short distance from her tent, just as page 9 of the Yellowstone Trails book diagrammed. The contents were now pillaged by the bear and set out in an area about three feet square. Based on the evidence at the scene, Brigida had climbed into her sleeping bag after arranging her camp and tent to her liking and according to the safety guidelines in the brochures she had with her. Her head was positioned near her tent flap, and she had probably angled herself diagonally to offset a slight slant in the ground. The bear had apparently investigated her tent, and may have smelled the scented lip sunscreen residue on her lips, or may have heard her breathing as she slept. The bear tore open her tent, and bit onto either her skull or her neck, and dragged her straight out of her tent through the rip, while she remained inside her sleeping bag. About six feet from her tent, and where her sleeping bag now rested so neatly, she was pulled from her only remaining protection. From that point, the investigators followed a scarcely noticeable drag trail that went west of the campfire ring, across the trail, and uphill toward the trees to the northeast of the campground. Along this drag trail, they found Brigida's bloody sweater with rips and tears caused by the bear's claws and teeth. A few yards further along the drag trail, they found her cotton pullover t-shirt, now bloodied and made dirty from the bear attack. About 250 feet from her tent, the investigators found the remains of Brigida Freidenhagen. The grizzly had partially consumed her corpse and her remains were recovered for analysis by the coroner. Immediately after Brigida's death, the area around White Lake was closed to all visitors while the rangers placed bear traps and conducted surveillance on any bears found in the area. After looking over how Brigida had tied her food cache up in a tree, investigators surmised that the bear was able to climb the tree high enough to retrieve her food cache. They believed that the resulting attack on Brigida occurred because the bear had retrieved it and was initially protecting it from what it viewed as a threat to its food. The coroner found that Brigida had died from hemorrhage and shock due to multiple lacerations received during the bear attack. It was noted in the investigator's final report that she followed all safety guidelines recommended by the brochures and park officials. The investigative team used the track size and span of the tooth and claw wounds on Brigida's body to estimate the size and age of the bear that killed her. They guessed the bear to be between two and three years of age, making it a sub-adult bear, but no other details were offered regarding the sex or health of the bear, as it was never caught or killed. Given that DNA science could not be used at the time of the attack, there was no way investigators could conclude they had killed the bear that killed Brigida. They would have had to kill the bear before her tissues it had consumed had cleared its digestive system to be conclusively identified as human remains. That left only a day or so window to kill the bear and perform a necropsy and tissue extraction from its digestive system. This process was not completed in a manner that would strictly identify the bear that had attacked, killed, and consumed Brigida. In the aftermath of Brigida's death, the Interagency Grizzly Bear Committee reviewed and refined the park regulations for backcountry campers. Their analysis concluded that better ways to store food needed to be emphasized for backcountry campers. They also reviewed the proximity of campsites to trails that bears may travel. The proximity of cooking and campfire ring locations to the sleeping sites was reviewed as well as campsite locations in comparison to preferred bear habitat. Finally, the committee recommended that single backcountry campers be discouraged and the public be made aware that groups are much safer than being alone in bear country. A public awareness program was put together to ensure people venturing into the backcountry for camping were aware of the risks of doing so. Even though these changes were accepted and implemented too late to avoid Brigida's horrible demise, they may have been instrumental in protecting backcountry campers since her attack. Brigida Friedenhagen was the first person killed in the park since 1972 to the point of her death. Since population assessments were initiated in 1975, grizzly bear numbers have increased from 136 to over 1,063 in 2021. The grizzlies have also increased their occupied habitat by over 50 percent. 
When you add those two trend lines, you can see that by increasing the grizzly populations by nearly tenfold, while only increasing the area from which they draw resources by 50%, it is easy to conclude that grizzly numbers are at an overpopulated threshold and may be overburdening their food and territorial resources. This stress on grizzlies may lead to continued and increasing incidents of them venturing closer to human civilization. Postscript Former park ranger Jerry Mernon wrote about a nuisance bear in his book titled Yellowstone Ranger. Bear number 88 was a young male who weighed 375 pounds and had developed a history of aggressive and nuisance behaviors around the fishing bridge area. The bear had been relocated a few times but returned each time. Mr. Mernon believed that it was bear number 88 who pulled Brigetta Friedenhagen from her tent and ate her and a few days later pulled a 12-year-old boy from his in a similar fashion. The difference was the boy slipped out of the sleeping bag while the bear dragged him away. Upon losing the boy, the young boar ran into the forest and abandoned his attack. Bear number 88 was euthanized in August of 1984. I trust the conclusions of Jerry Mernon and point to the fact that grizzly bear attacks involving people being pulled from their tents as they slept stopped immediately after bear number 88 was euthanized. After reviewing the details in this episode, I am left with a few questions for you. Do you think the grizzly was defending its food cache from Brigida's suspended food sack, or did it attack her out of strictly predatory motives? Since the bear was never identified, do you think it will have the inclination to kill and eat more people? Would the presence of Andreas and Yanko have deterred the bear from attacking Brigida? Why do you think the park regulations would prevent anyone from carrying a firearm to protect themselves? Although she followed every instruction the authorities published in the many brochures and books she read, what more could Brigitta have done to ensure her safety? I will be glad to read and reply to your thoughts, so please post them in the comment section below, and let's talk about it. Thank you for watching Scary Bear Attacks. If you've enjoyed this episode, please consider clicking on the like button and clicking on the bell icon. We'll help you know when we post our new episodes. Posting our video links to your social media profiles furthers awareness, and it's fun. We slashed our prices in our merch store, linked below. So check out the bargains there while you shop. As a member of our human community, remember to adventure bravely and be careful out there, especially in bear country.